I love Candon, love what she carries, and I know that you're gonna enjoy this, the, the impact of her gifting. Camden has impacted me, her and Brian, just their marriage, doing ministry together. My wife and I, Chelsea, got to meet them before, I believe before they got married. And I, I can tell you this, they're authentic. The ministry that she's gonna bring you is authentically her, and it's gonna impact you, not only you, but your family for generations. And so why don't you welcome up Camden as she comes to share with us. Thank you so much. Man, we have an amazing production team. Let's just give it up for our amazing production team that's here. They actually got here like a day, like on Tuesday and just set up for hours and they're incredible. Um, but hi, my name is Camden. I'm so excited to be here with you guys this morning. And before I start sharing, I just wanna go to the Lord and pray and really my heart is that our hearts are engaged with him, that we're able to enter into deeper intimacy because there is so much that God is doing in this time. Just like Dr. Kim Moss was sharing last night and Dr. Randy Clark, I believe that it's true that we are in a season of revival, that God is preparing us. And that's part of what I'm gonna share this morning is about how we can partner with him and be prepared uh, to go all the way with him because that's my heart and prayer. I wanna go all the way with you, Jesus. So let's just take a moment to engage our hearts if you want to just focus on Jesus, on lifting him high. And Jesus, I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you, Lord, that we were made in your image, that we were made to bear you, that we were made to display you, that it's our great privilege, our great honor in this life that we can live it laid down for you. And I pray, God, that you would awaken something in our hearts, that we would be gripped by your mission that we would be gripped and we would not be shaken, we would not be moved just like Martin Smith was singing, that we would be so compelled by love, that we would truly capture your heart, that we would see people as you see them. And I thank you, Jesus, that we were made for that. We were made for that intimacy with you. So we just invite you in in a deeper way this morning. Have your way in us, Jesus. We honor your name. May our lives be lived solely for you, in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> amen. So just to give a brief introduction about myself, because I know some people here, and Voice of the Prophets and Voice of the Apostles is so fun because it's like a big family reunion getting to see people. We've had some, uh, I attended Global School of Supernatural Ministry, so we've had some different people that were in class with me that I haven't seen in years, and it's so fun to see you guys. Um, but some of you all don't know who I am and don't know anything about me. So I just wanted to share some of my journey. I grew up in a cessationist home, uh, which some people I've realized don't know what that means, but it means that uh, the gifts ceased with the, they believe that the gifts ceased with the original apostles. And so for me, I wasn't in a church that preached against the Holy Spirit, but I just never heard about the Holy Spirit. And I grew up in an amazing Christian home. I had amazing parents, um, but I lost my dad suddenly when I was eight years old in a really crazy way, and um, he was 34, so it was very unexpected. And we saw our community come around us in a beautiful way. Um, but I was suddenly thrust into this difficult circumstance that I didn't really know how to, how to process, how to handle. And then a few years later, I developed uh, chronic pain and I started having severe migraines. Um, so bad that it was about a level seven or eight migraine and I ended up having a migraine that never went away for about four and a half years. And so I was in this place where I was desperate for Jesus. I didn't realize that I needed Jesus. Um, when I was in that environment, I saw Christianity and, and I had amazing parents, so I thought that this is probably the way, but I hadn't experienced it in a way that was really real for me. 
And so we had tried so many different things. My parents spent tens of thousands of dollars because with migraines, it's hard to know exactly what the cause is. And so we went to so many different doctors and, and no one really had any answers for me. And so when I was around 15 years old, uh, my mom posted on Facebook that I was gonna have to get uh, Botox shots or be hospitalized for two weeks. And someone reached out to me and offered to pray for me over the phone. And at this time, I was dealing with um, depression and anxiety and, and I tried so many different things. I wasn't expecting anything to happen. But when he prayed for me over the phone, his name was uh, Kevin Reardon from Pennsylvania. He prayed for me over the phone and for the first time in four years, I felt my pain leave. It was amazing. <clears throat> I didn't end up getting completely healed until a year later and I found out that some of the cause for my migraines was uh, severe food allergies, uh, which this was, when I got completely healed, was about 10 years ago. And at the time, people didn't know as much about digestive issues and stuff. Um, but I would have severe swelling in my gut, and I could barely eat anything. And, and so Kevin invited me to come up to a conference. It was actually the first uh, healing and training weekend that Dr. Mike Hutchings, if you guys know him, he'd recently been hired by Global, and he was doing a five-step prayer model, word of knowledge training. And so I ended up going up to that meeting with Kevin, and someone just on the team uh, gave a word of knowledge, and I went up believing that I needed to be healed because at that point, I was eating so strict. It was very hard for me to travel. I had to make all my own food, and it had to be gluten-free, dairy-free, all these things free. And so I knew that I had to get healed while I was up there. And someone on the team had a word of knowledge for me on the first night. I knew it was for me. I went up, 90% of my pain was gone, and then the remaining 10% left the next morning, and I've been completely pain-free since. <laughs> And God is so faithful. And recently, um, my husband and I ministered together, like Richie was saying. We just got back from Sweden last weekend, um, where God is moving in power. It was amazing. And this is an atheistic country where um, people are pursuing all sorts of different outlets. But God came in power. And I was sharing with them that it's important to fight for the power of God, because that was what I needed to see. I needed an experience with his power. I needed an experience with his presence. And that's why I love what Dr. Randy Clark has built here at Global Awakening, because once I experienced that, I realized God is real and he's with me. And it created such a hunger within me and boldness within me, because I'd been in the church up to 16 years at that point and didn't realize that God was really real and he was with me. But when I experienced his power, when I experienced his presence through healing, I realized, wow, God's with me. And I just, all I wanted to do was give it away. And so I ended up going on a Youth Power Invasion, which is one of our uh, teen ministry trips. And I went in 2014. And when I came back, I had this powerful experience uh, with the Holy Spirit. I actually was watching a YouTube video. My friend sent me a YouTube video called Are You Hungry? Um, and it was with uh, Leonard Ravenhill and a couple other people like that. But basically the premise of the video was uh, that prayer from Jacob where I will not let you go unless you bless me. And it created this tenacity and hunger for me to just go after the things of God. And, and I wanna encourage the people that are in high school and are in college. And actually when I was in worship, I felt prompted to pray for that group at the end. Um, but I want to encourage you because for me, when I had that experience with his power, I've started to pursue seeing God move in my high school. And, and I remember people didn't know what to do with me because I was in this private Baptist high school and uh, they hadn't seen anything like what I was, you know, doing. And some people, some people loved it. Some people started coming to me and I found out weird dreams people were having and all sorts of spiritual experiences people were having that they felt like they had to cover up. And then some people were freaked out and hid from me. <laughs> um, but God started moving, and God had me start having um, healing meetings at my house, and people would fall out. And I invited my friend Kevin, who's amazing, but he's not like Dr. Randy, where he explains everything that's happening and how it's going to happen to you. <laughs> and so people just started falling out and waking up, and then they're like, what just happened to me? Or coming up to me shaking, why am I shaking, you know? But it was amazing seeing God move in that place. And one story I want to share 
particularly to encourage some of the younger people that are in here is I ended up going um, on a leadership retreat and I was just crying out to God. Like, I mean, I would get on my knees and say, God, I need you to come, you know, and people are like staring at me. But when they saw that, when they saw that desperation for God, uh, it drew them in. And I remember during one of my leadership retreat meetings, I had about, we had about 200 there, different leaders in the high school, and I was in a group of about 50. And I remember the Holy Spirit was resting on me, and he told me to share with them uh, that he'd set me free from depression, from anxiety, and also was dealing with um, pornography, that God had set me free from those things when I got healed. And I didn't want to share it because I didn't feel comfortable being that vulnerable with them. But in that place, with the Holy Spirit leading me, in that place of transparency and vulnerability, I shared it, and I saw the Holy Spirit fall on one person at a time, and they began to sovereignly repent and say, I never told anyone this before, but I'm struggling with this. And I remember seeing one of the most popular guys in my class uh, he started crying, and he said, I, I hold open the door for people, and, and I try to do nice things, but I don't know if I'm actually a good person. And he just started crying, and it was amazing to see the Lord begin to touch people like that, and I believe that that's something that he wants to do again in this time. I believe that he is awakening people's hearts. I believe that he is healing us, and that's something that I'm going to focus on, and Kim was talking about last night with an emphasis on repentance. But I believe that that's something that God is doing. And I want to encourage you and encourage people that are younger like me that God is with you. And that when you step out, even when you feel uncomfortable, that the Lord will back you up. And I've seen it. I've seen it happen. <clears throat> and it's amazing. It's amazing. Even in that place of uncomfortability and, and vulnerability, God backs you up. And it's the best Thing that I can live for. The only thing I want to live for is for him. Amen? Amen? <laughs> so I just want to encourage you guys about the state of where people are in. You know, a lot of us have been talking about Asbury and whether you think it was a revival or not, we can see that people are hungry to experience God. It only really lasted for a few weeks, but so many people dropped what they were doing to go be a part of it. And people are hungry right now for the Lord. I actually uh, lived when I was in high school and, and got healed. I was living in Louisville, Kentucky, which is not that far from Wilmore. And I know that there's not a lot there. <laughs> um, but people came to a place in the middle of nowhere because they want to experience God. And I believe that the Jesus Revolution movie, part of that is emphasizing to us that spiritual search that so many are on. I recently just finished reading uh, No Compromise about Keith Green's life. And in the beginning of the book, which by the way, it's a great book, definitely recommend. Um, but in the beginning of the book, they take a long time to talk about their spiritual searching and how so much of Southern California at the time was on a spiritual searching journey. And I believe that that's where so many people are right now, that they're searching for something real, that they're searching for something authentic and one story that I heard recently that I love actually happened with two people that are a part of Global. Um, one of them is Natalie Canodal, one of my friends in second year, and then uh, Riesa, who works for our partners team. And they recently went to a Thai restaurant and asked the waiter uh, if he knew what it meant to be born again. And they just started having a conversation with him, invited the Holy Spirit to come, and suddenly... He felt all this electricity, like his hair was standing up on his body. And then, actually, Jesus came to him in a vision. And they knew that it was Jesus because he said, what color clothes does Jesus wear? Because <laughs> he saw a man in all white coming to him. It's just amazing. And what's so incredible to me about that story is that they just made themselves available. It shows that God is hungry to pour himself out if we just make ourselves available. We just give our ability and God gives his divine ability. We don't have to try to make something happen, but because the harvest is ripe, as we make ourselves available, then there's so much more that God wants to do. 
So I believe that it's important for us to posture ourselves to be a part of that, to strengthen ourselves. And I think that that's a part of, um, a part of why God is emphasizing repentance, a part of why there's more of an emphasis on the fear of the Lord, a part of why there's a higher uh, mark, because God is wanting to bring us and invite us into that place with him. But we have to prepare our hearts, we have to prepare ourselves to partner with him in that place. Right now, my prayer is that it would be like in Egypt. I love thinking about in Egypt where God dismantled the Egyptian gods one by one. And I think that when he was doing that, it was like he was preaching the first commandment that there shall be no other gods before me. And that's my prayer right now as we're in the midst of people dealing with mixture, as we're in the midst of people that are pursuing uh, witchcraft, people that are pursuing shamanism, people that are pursuing the new age and genuinely searching. And I believe that God's going to show up in power to demonstrate there shall be no other gods before me. <laughs> that he alone rules. And so that's my heart. But if we're going to enter into that place with him, then we need to follow him. Then we need to be yielded to him. And recently I was in a church service in Lancaster, Pennsylvania with some great friends of ours, uh, Jake and Anna Kale. And we were pressing in for revival as so many churches are right now and, and just praying that God would position us. And I felt God remind me um, of Exodus 33, which is an incredible passage, but specifically the first part of the chapter, which Exodus 33, uh, verse one through three says, then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised you on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants, and I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you along the way. <laughs> those are some strong words from God. <laughs> so often I feel like though in those strong words we, we see the heart of God that he, he wanted to lead his people and so there's this commentary that I read that really impacted me about it, which says, this was a challenge to Moses and the nation as a whole. God told them that they could have the promised land, but he would not remain with them in a close, personal way. If they were satisfied with that arrangement, it would prove that they only loved God's blessings and not God himself. If they challenged God, pleading with him for his presence, not only his blessings, it would show a genuine heart for God himself. This was the first step towards spiritual restoration and revival in Israel. And when I read that, I felt like that was something God was speaking to my heart and to the church in America right now where it can be so easy for us. You see, one of the things that was impactful to me about this passage is God was faithful to do what he said he was gonna do. He was still going to lead them into the promised land. He just was going to have an angel lead them, but he still wasn't going to revoke his promises because God's faithful. But the, the question was, was that enough for them or did they want to be led by God himself? And I believe that that's something that God is asking us in the church in America right now, where sometimes we can see that as people are coming in, we think, okay, God's blessing this, and, and he is, and, and there's amazing things that God can do, but I guess I'm just speaking to the fact that even in places where people are getting saved, we need to make sure that we're positioning ourselves to be led by God, that we're not just doing something because it works, because we like to follow rules. Recently, my husband and I were talking about uh, Orthodox Jews and I don't know if you've ever read how many rules they have, but they have so many rules, even down to how much water should be in their soup and all these really intense rules. And that's what we like. We want to follow a structure. We want to follow the rules. We want to have it laid out for us and see, okay, yeah, this works. And there's nothing wrong with structure. 
But what's important for us is, are we actually being led by God? Just because people are getting saved, do we know that we're actually following him? And I believe that that's the challenge that God is speaking to us in our hearts right now, that we're not just satisfied only with the blessings or external growth, which are not bad things, but that we're settling for nothing less but them being led by him into those things. Does that make sense? And of course, as you continue to read in the chapter, you see Moses humbled himself before God, and God says that he's a God of mercy and compassion, and he caused, and when he prayed for the glory of God, it was actually his goodness that went before him. His goodness passed in front of him and proclaimed his name, the Lord, that he will have mercy on whom he will have mercy and compassion on whom he will have compassion. So God didn't abandon Israel and he's not going to abandon us. So that's not meant as a condemnation thing, but it's that we need to be led by his spirit and he's going to pour out more as we live in that place of abandonment to him. So as we're preparing for what God is doing, I wanted to look some at John the Baptist and how he prepared people to receive the Messiah. I believe that this is a time where, I've heard so many people talking about John the Baptist because I think that this is a time where God is preparing us to partner with him. So I'm gonna read some from uh, Matthew 3. If you have your Bibles, you're welcome to turn there. Or you can look on your phone. I love having an actual Bible with me too. There's something just so special about having your actual Bible, but I also use my phone. All right, so Matthew 3, 1 through 11. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who's more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So this is a powerful ministry that God birthed, and we can see so much more from John and even how uh, he was set apart in his mother's womb and the Holy Spirit filled him even when he was in Elizabeth's womb, which is amazing. But two things that I want to focus on from this passage is that John called people to change their perspective, which I believe is a part of entering further into revival, and that he also called them to bear the fruits of repentance. So for my first point with that, with that he called us to change our perspective, I'm sure many of you all have heard that repentance, when he says repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near, Repentance means to change the way you think, metanoia, shifting our perspective. And so shifting is a key part of staying in step with what God is doing. We have to be willing to bend to him and shift with him as he moves. And John is actually shifting their perspective in a really radical way, more radical than we realized just initially reading the text. So one of the ways that John was shifting their perspective is he was saying the Messiah is near and coming sooner than you all thought. There actually was about 400 years of prophetic silence in between uh, Malachi and John, which to put that into perspective, uh, I looked this up that the United States has only been a country for 247 years. So it's a long period of silence. 
where it would be easy to not expect something to happen. Yet John, when he was preaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he was using the Greek word eginzo, which means extreme closeness, immediate eminence. To give you an example, it's like when you invite house guests over and you're doing all the preparing for them to come and then suddenly they're there at the door. They're knocking at the door. They're immediately there. It's that, ex- that's that immediate closeness and you yell to your spouse, hey, our guests are here and you're about to open the door for them to come in. That's how close the Messiah was. But at that time, Israel could have easily been in a place of complacency because it had been so long since they'd heard anything from the Lord. So John was sent to wake them up and to announce that the Messiah was coming near. And there was a massive response to John's message, so much so that we even see in Acts that he had followers spread all the way to Africa where they knew of John's baptism, but not of Jesus' baptism. So there was something that resonated in their hearts to recognize, okay, the Messiah, we need to get ready for the Messiah and position our hearts. Another way that he was shifting their perspective is that the Messiah was coming for everyone. Because John was preaching to both Jews and Gentiles, which would have been controversial at the time. And and we can infer that because we see that he's speaking to soldiers as well. Now, I don't think that John necessarily had a full understanding of the new covenant and what Jesus was doing. But we have to remember that baptism at the time was different than baptism now. Where now we, we, you know, die to ourselves and then are raised to Christ. That wasn't what baptism meant for them then. Back then, it was something that the Gentiles did to come and join Judaism. And so for the Jews to be willing to be baptized was a very humbling thing for them. They basically were saying that they were just as far off from God as the Gentiles were. So they had to enter into a lot of humility to be willing to be baptized by John. And we can see that even later in, um, in Paul's writings uh, and in Acts, that this was something that was really hard for the Jewish Christians to reconcile, even after the Holy Spirit came. One thing that really impressed me one time, uh, it was just interesting, was uh, when Paul confronts Peter because he stopped eating with the Gentiles. But I looked this up, it actually happened after he had the experience he did with Cornelius. And I think that that just speaks to how difficult that was for them, the peer pressure that they dealt with. Um, and, and even in uh, Galatians 6, Paul talks about there's some different Jewish Christians that want the Gentiles to be circumcised. And he says that they're preaching it because they don't want to be persecuted for the cross of Christ. And it's because back then that's what made them look good, that they were able to bring them into this religious structure that they were familiar with. So it took a lot of humility for them to push through that and be willing to be baptized by John. Another way that he was shifting their perspective is he was shifting it on sin, that it was personal, that it was real, that the decision to come to God was personal. Because back then, Jews were accounted for on on the day of the atonement and the priests would repent on behalf of the nation. And so it was suddenly this personal recognition of sin in the heart. And, and it wasn't just a corporate national level of sin, but individual heart level that, that John's message was emphasizing to them. So people came in multitudes to confess their sin and to be baptized, which was amazing. And having that recognition of the personal responsibility and, personal, and posturing them for that personal relationship that Jesus wanted to instill as the Holy Spirit came. So it was really preparing them for what God was going to do. So there's a few different things that we can pull out from that which is one that for those that are hungry and humble, no one will be left out. Us partnering with the Holy Spirit in this way, this is for everyone, just like the Gentiles were able to respond. And we see later in Acts 2 that it's for everyone, that there's no class that's excluded, there's no gender that is excluded, there's no age that's excluded. Everyone gets to be included. The only thing that we need to do is posture ourselves in this hungry place, in this humble place, where we're able to respond to the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we can look to our heroes in the faith and see their victories and see what they've done, but we don't realize that so often God chooses people from the lowly places. I love uh, what Paul writes 
in 1 Corinthians 1, 27, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And, and that helps us realize that God can really use whoever he wants. Just like Dr. Randy Clark talks about, that any of us can be selected, and sometimes we put this barrier between us and where someone's been, or even when we think about the new thing that God's doing, you, know, you have no idea the impact that, could be, that God could do through you as you're just yielded to him. You really don't know uh, what he can do in and through your life just as you live yielded to him. Just like it says in Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. So we need to recognize this time and season that we're in and step out in faith. And as we shift our perspective, it helps shift our measure of faith for what's available in this season. John was announcing to the crowd that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, not some distant, far off reality. And so in that part of posturing, I believe that part of that is what I shared with Exodus 33 and how we can practically apply that here as a prophetic people is that we are pursuing his voice, that we're meant to be led by the voice of God. There's this amazing book I read by Dr. John Ruthven, uh, What's Wrong with Protestant Theology? And he shares that one of the main purposes of the new covenant is for us to receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and to be led by his voice. That's one of the main ways that we can respond in faith to him is when we posture ourselves to hear from his voice. And I think that that's so important especially here at a prophetic conference, that we are posturing ourselves to follow the voice of God. And for those that are new to that or don't know how to do that, I wanna encourage you to take this time to learn how to hear the voice of God. And we have so many amazing uh, resources that are available in our bookstore and, and there's resources available online. But posture yourself in a place where you can learn how to hear the voice of God because it's so important That was something I really needed as I was coming into the charismatic movement um, was learning how to discern that I was hearing from God and actually being able to grow in that place and then respond in faith to what he said. It's such an amazing thing that God has given us and so we need to press in for that in this time. And also how to discern what he's saying because sometimes God can speak and we don't have a proper understanding about what he's saying. One example of this is John 12, uh, 27 through 30, when Jesus is predict, uh, he's preaching to a crowd about his coming death. And Jesus said, now my soul is troubled, but what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it. The crowd that was there and heard it said it thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit and not mine. So I always thought that passage was so interesting that God can literally speak in this audible voice from heaven for the crowd's benefit. And yet some people think that it thundered and some people think It was an angel and it emphasizes to me that it's important for us to properly discern and apply the things that God is saying where we can know, okay, as he's speaking, this is what he intends to do and we can apply it. And some of the practical ways to do that, if if you don't know, because I like like to be practical, I want to give you some practical advice, is so practically growing and discerning how to hear his voice and the prophetic, spending time in prayer spending time in the secret place, spending time reading the Bible that testifies of Jesus and and, and God and who he is, spending time with him in that place, but also asking God for wisdom and for hearing hearts. You know, when Solomon prayed for wisdom, he's actually praying for a hearing heart that would hear what God was saying. And and I believe Randy recently, or I don't know if it was Bill, we were were uh, at a global event 
in Colorado a few weeks ago, talked about wisdom being a sign that the Holy Spirit uh, has filled you, has, has, has um, imparted something to you, is this divine wisdom that comes. And I think that that's something that we can be asking for in the season that, God, how can we have the wisdom to partner with, to understand, to know as you're speaking these things, how do I personally respond to that? How do I partner? What's my role? And I think that wisdom that God gives us can help us posture ourselves in that place. So the other, the other part that I want to focus on that John emphasized was producing the fruits of repentance and, and how that applies to us. Because Jesus was continually bringing our perspectives to a higher place. He was continually saying, you've heard it said, but I say to you. And I believe that that's a part of bearing the fruit of repentance and responding in repentance is coming up to this higher place that Jesus is inviting us into. As I shared earlier, John was shifting their perspective that suddenly it was a personal matter. It was on a heart level. And, and the Pharisees thought they were justified because they were descendants of Abraham. Yet John argues that God could raise up stones as sons of Abraham, meaning that God could raise up another chosen people from the stones if he wanted because he's that powerful. He was saying, you're missing the point. You're missing the point here. It's about your heart now. And, and for me, I feel like it so often just goes back to what's in my heart. Just like, just like uh, Martin Smith was sharing this morning, that purity. One of my biggest prayers is to have a pure heart that clean hands and a pure heart, that the pure in heart shall see God. I want to be able to experience God in this way. And, and the Pharisees, as we know, they, they were living in that place of hypocrisy where their hearts were far from him. But now suddenly that's what God is looking at. He's after the heart. And, and I believe that that's where repentance starts. Just like when Peter preached at the Pentecost sermon and people were cut to the heart and they asked what must I do to be saved? Because it impacted their hearts in such a way. God sees our hearts again and again, and, and scripture talks about that, that he knows the secrets of our hearts. And one message that I love that I've listened to uh, so many times is one from Roland Baker about a pure heart. And one of the things that he shares in it is when he talks about God healing your heart or, or conviction or things like that, people will come up to him and say, but God likes me the way I am. And he'll say back to them, God, God does love you. He loves you so much, but he doesn't want you to stay in that place. See, so often, uh, God, so how God is because of his love, he wants to see us made whole. And that's a part of what it means to walk in this place of giving things to him is that he invites us into a greater level of freedom because in that place what we have in our heart is, is bondage in our heart that the enemy can use to distract us, that can use to get us off mission, that can use to, just like the serpent said in the garden, did God really say, whisper these things into our heart when we have things that we need to give to him because God wants to give us clean hearts. He wants to heal our hearts so we can walk in more freedom and live more fully alive because you were made to live fully alive in him. So he wants to bring us to that place, but we have to let him, we have to let him in. And part of that is responding to his conviction. Part of that is giving things to him in this place when we repent. And, and conviction is, is different than condemnation. In fact, if you're struggling with condemnation, I want you to know that that's not from the Lord, because the devil condemns you and is the accuser of the brethren. But God convicts you, and, and some of the ways that you can tell the difference, to be practical again, is that condemnation feels like shame. It feels like greater bondage. It feels like a burden. But Jesus says that his yoke is easy, that his burden is light. Conviction brings hope, and it empowers us even when, as you read through some of the lengthy Old Testament prophecies where God's saying, you know, that Israel's broken his heart, there's these judgment prophecies. Even as you read through those, you see that again and again, God says, even though you've wronged me, even though you've hurt me, I am a God of mercy. I am a God of compassion. God provides a way out. He was continually prophesying 
about the Messiah coming as Isaiah and Jeremiah, these different prophets, they were prophesying about the Messiah that was coming. So there was ne- it was never a final close. There was always the way out that God provided. And that's a part of what conviction offers us. That's why I think that it's so a powerful and beautiful when we allow God to convict us. And I've rarely grown in holiness by trying to be holier. I've really tried, and I, and I haven't. <laughs> you know, my, my, uh, I wasn't necessarily in a Baptist church. I was in a, a Plymouth Brethren church is what I grew up in. Um, but that kind of upbringing, it's like, for me, I felt like I just had to be self-disciplined. To be close to God, you know, you have your quiet time for a certain amount of time, and 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 so when I first encountered God, I thought, oh, I want to give everything to you, and so I'm going to have no fun. I'm going to give up everything, you know. <laughs> and so I was like, not watching any movies or any TV or anything. Um, and the Lord had to kind of teach me how to be in this place with Him. But I didn't grow in holiness by trying to be holier. And in fact, when I struggle with striving, it's harder for me to discern God's voice. I hear the Lord better when I know I could never earn his affection. But when we're experiencing that conviction, we have to remember that his heart is burdened for us to not stray from the eternal life that he's offering us, to not stray from from living fully alive in him. He wants a genuine connection, not a forced commitment. He wants this type of conviction that cuts to our heart. And it's not always about us doing blatant sin. Sometimes, you know, in James it talks about for those that know that something is wrong and they do it anyways, that, that's sin for them. And, and I think that sometimes with the, we sometimes just think of blatant sin, but it's not, it's not just that. It's, it's are our hearts sensitive to him? I don't want to have a hardened heart that would miss what God's doing. I'm gonna have a sensitive heart. And I believe that you guys wanna have sensitive hearts that are sensitive to the wind of the spirit. And you know, many times our hardness of heart can be due to a lack of trust that we have in God or or wounds that are in our hearts that that God wants to come and and deal with and, and heal because he's so kind. And sometimes we can we can distance ourselves from him because we're sure, is he really that? good? Is he really that trustworthy? Can I really, can I really give my whole self to him? Sometimes we feel like we can do that in, in certain areas, but then there's some areas that, and he knows, he knows those areas that we have a hard time trusting him with. And sometimes that's where we can distance ourselves. But you see, God, God wants our honesty. He can't start building something upon a false foundation. He needs to start with the truth, even if, it's, even if it feels messy. That's one of the things that I love about God. When I'm having a hard time or when he reveals something to me that I need healed, that I need to give to him, he's convicting me, and I come to him and say, God, I'm, I'm not in that place. I'm not there. <laughs> and then he's like, that's okay. Just invite me into that place. Just invite me in. And he can give us his perspective. He can heal us. We have to come to him, and we have to trust him. We have to trust him to be in that place. We have to be vulnerable with him, and then he can build upon that space. You see, David carried this sensitivity of heart when he prayed in Psalm 51, 17. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken spirit and a contrite heart, God, you will not despise. And God prayed this after Nathan the prophet confronted him about sinning against the Lord of Bathsheba. So he recognized that what he did was sin and and he brought his heart, which was broken over his sin, to the Lord as a sacrifice. David knew that the Lord didn't want something for something ritualistic. He wanted us to come before him in humility and transparency. And it's in that place of uncomfortability that true change happens, just like uh, many have shared about the, the powerful analogy with a butterfly And in that place of the cocoon uh, where it's just melting all down and becoming a new creature, it's that space of uncomfortability where God can begin to build something within us. I love 
uh, the quote from Bill Johnson where he says, fire always falls on sacrifice. And John the Baptist prepared the people by baptizing them in water and repentance, but then they were ready to receive the Holy Spirit and fire because their hearts were ready to receive God. And when our hearts are revived in that place, then we can step further into faith with him. A lot of it for me, as I've grown in my relationship with God, I grow in trust with him. And then I'm able to take more steps in faith with him because I've surrendered more of my heart to him. And so then responding in faith feels easier because I'm resting in him. You know, Jesus is one of the, Jesus is the only true place of rest for our souls. We can rest in him. We can rest in his kindness and his compassion and his mercy. And it's in that place of resting in him because he wants to lead us that we can respond in faith. And I believe that for the people that are allowing God to do this in our hearts, and I believe you're that type of people, that God is raising up other people to carry this type of message to prepare the way, just like John prepared the way, because John was a person that was set apart for the Lord, and and he walked in the fear of God, and he wasn't swayed by the crowds, even though he was gathering multitudes and had a huge impact, that didn't affect him because of his relationship with God. He had this purity of heart. And you see that in the life of Jesus too. I, I always love um, at, the end of the, at the end of the miracle when Jesus uh, multiplies the loaves and the fishes for the crowd of 5,000, and then he goes away on the mountain to pray, and then he comes back and preaches this really offensive message to his Jewish audience about my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. But you see that in those moments, just like John, Jesus was able to stand. And I believe he was able to stand because he was affirmed, because he was in that place of prayer connected to the Lord. Now, it's not that we necessarily, you know, it's not like crowds are wrong. It's not like we have to necessarily preach an offensive message or not. It's about being led by the Lord. And when we're led by the Lord, we can be in a place of confidence and security because we know him. And you see that in the fruit of Jesus and with John as they stand before the crowds that they're not swayed, they're not riding the crowds, they're just listening to the one voice. In the midst of a multitude of voices that we can listen to the one voice. And I believe that that's why it's important for us to understand the fear of the Lord in this time because um, for me, it's like weighing the Lord. First of all, recognizing who he truly is, that he is eternal, that he is almighty, that there's no other being like him, that there's no other gods before him, that he alone is the Lord, that he's the ancient of days, that he's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. And so part of walking in the fear of the Lord is recognizing how valuable he is, how precious he is. And it's about submitting to him as Lord, that we are reliant upon him, that we can't do this on our own, that we weren't meant to do this on our own. In fact, I think one of the most uh, powerful things that we've been called to is to live dependent upon him, that we would live leaning upon our beloved. And when we don't define who Jesus is and lack of a clear definition, we can risk losing who he really is. And so it's important for us to define, to understand, to to see him rightly. That's why I think so often in the scripture it talks about uh, those that fear the Lord have the favor of the Lord, have the protection of the Lord, because they see him rightly. They see him rightly as he is. And the thing that's so amazing about God is that he is a God that is all powerful and and, and all consuming fire, but he's full of love. I don't know about you, but there's something so, makes me feel so secure and so satisfied that the most powerful force there is is a God of mercy and love and compassion. And as I lift him high in my heart, then I can rest in that place. I just need to follow him as Lord. I want to recognize him as Lord. And that's why it's important to walk in the fear of the Lord, as we recognize that our goal is to be made more like him. 
our goals to be made more like him. And, and if we aren't following him as Lord, then we can make him into an image of ourselves. That's why we need to be led by him. That's why we need to be willing to be corrected and, and shifted by him so we can be led by him. So we're being made into his image and who he made us to truly be. I can lay down my life, I can sacrifice, I can, I can have joy, I can know that, I can do all these things when I know that I'm living for Jesus who's eternal. And I believe that God is raising up these pure vessels right now to be a voice, to be a voice and to, and to help prepare people, to help lead people to Jesus and help awaken the body into the new thing that he's doing, which actually is an old thing that he's restoring I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this time. So I want to shift into um, just, just pursuing the Lord together. And, and there's another passage I just want to read over you guys, but I believe I connected with uh, Nate. I don't know if he's nearby, but if you could come uh, out here. Nate, thank you, Nate. <laughs> and just be on the keys. I believe that we're preparing a path for new believers and new leaders. And, and this isn't just about one generation, but it's about people that have had experience with God that can lead the new people in. I don't think it's just about the older generation leading the younger generation is, but it's, it's all of us that have had these experiences with God that can come in and disciple the new people and lead them and then teach them the way, teach them his ways and help give them a firm foundation just like I've been talking about so often, it's just so freeing to be in his love and to stand on his love. But you have to learn that. You have to learn that you can stand on his love. You have to learn how to steward this place with him. You have to learn how to steward the secret place. And we, as we prepare ourselves, we can do that. We can help invite people into this place with him where they can stand on their own two feet and rely and rely upon God. I don't wanna just... I want to invite people to the well. I don't want them to just come to me, you know? And, and we're here to be gifts, and I believe, I feel that for me and for Brian and, and for different leaders that are here, that we can lay down our lives as a gift, just like Paul talked about, being a drink offering, that we can lay down ourselves in that way. But ultimately, the goal is that we would bring people to the well, that they could go and get a drink. I love that passage where Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman and he says, if you know who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink of water. Because in him, we can be truly satisfied. It's so beautiful. <clears throat> so I wanna, I wanna do a few things as I'm, as I'm kinda shifting into more ministry time here. I wanna read a passage from Revelation 3 uh, that I felt like tied similarly to the Exodus 33 passage I read at the beginning about being dependent upon God. And sometimes we can read these words I'm about to read are some strong words from Jesus. But sometimes I feel like we can miss what God is actually communicating when we're just reading these strong words and think, oh, that sounds strong. But what actually God is communicating is the heart of a bridegroom king that longs for us to live dependent upon him and led by him and knowing that that's what we were really made for, knowing that we were made to live in that place. And so these words from Revelation 3 communicate that, that we, that Jesus is inviting this church in Laodicea to, to live dependent upon him. You see, this church was, it was a, a wealthy community. Laodicea was a wealthy community and they felt very sufficient on their own, and Jesus was challenging them to say that you need me. Don't take in what's going on in the culture around you. You need me. So I'm gonna read these words over you in Revelation 3. These are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot, and I wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. And you say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched and pitiful and poor and blind and naked. 
I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. So I know that these are some strong words, but what I love about it is that he says, I know you think, I know you think that that is enough. I know you think that you're in a safe place, but don't you realize that I have something more valuable to give you if you'll just lean upon me. I have something more. I have something that's more valuable than gold that's been refined in the fire. I love when, when Peter talks about in 1 Peter that we've been given something more precious than silver or gold. And you think about the whole process that goes into making silver and gold. Yet we've been given something more precious through the unblemished blood of a slain lamb. It's more precious. And we need that more. And God, God gives us these things because he's kind and he gives us blessings. And I'm not saying that God doesn't do that. But I'm saying that sometimes we need to realize that what he has, relying on him. We can't rely on just earthly things. We need to rely on him and heavenly things. And from that place, as we pursue the kingdom of God, as we pursue righteousness, all other things will be added to us. Just like Jesus talks about, do not be anxious for tomorrow. Today has enough trouble of its own that we can live reliant upon him. And I just want us to focus our hearts on Jesus. And, and I want to pray, God, what are the things that we're, that we're relying on more than we're relying on you? Jesus, what are those things? God, I pray that we can all just, however you want to posture yourself to engage with the Lord. If you want to put your hand over your heart or, or bow your head and close your eyes, whatever that looks like for you. Jesus, I pray that you would show us things that are hindering us in our hearts from fully relying on you. God, that you would convict us, that you would heal us. If there's things in our heart where we're saying, we're relying on that more than we're relying on you, Jesus, that you'd reveal that to us. That we could lean upon you as our beloved. I pray, Jesus, that even now you would speak things to people's hearts that you would speak things to their hearts, that things would be awakened within them, that you would heal, that they can trust you, God, that the things that are revealed, that God, that you'd heal, that they know that they can trust you in that area. You are worthy of it all. You're the name that's lifted above every other name, you're worthy. And Jesus, I just pray that you would show us, you'd speak to us. Thank you, Lord. I didn't read the last verse that says, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. He wants to come and dine with you. I remember hearing Missy Edwards share one time about this vision she had with the Lord where he was knocking on our door and she didn't wanna let him into her house because it was messy. And he came in and, and spread out a big picnic blanket and a banquet because he wanted to eat with her in that place. And I believe that that's what God's inviting us into. So we have a couple minutes left. There's one thing I did feel like God spoke to me about during worship. Um, so if there's anyone in here that is high school age, maybe some seniors um, or college age, could you stand up? there's anyone in here that's in that age range. Okay, there's a few people. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. So 
I just wanna extend our hands towards, towards them because I believe that, that high schools and college campuses right now are such a mission field. And I believe that God is sending out missionaries into the harvest. And for me, one of the reasons I shared my stories in the beginning was to be a, an encouragement for you because I wouldn't consider myself to be naturally a really bold person. But I've had experiences with the Lord where he filled me with his boldness and he filled me with his bravery. And I know that that's something that God has given me on my life. And I wanna pray the same for you, that God would use you to break the yoke of bondage that's holding so many people in blindness. That God would awaken something in their hearts. So let's just extend our hands to these people. God, I pray for high school students, for the ones that are here, for college students, the ones that are here, and also just the ones in America, Lord, that you would awaken something in their hearts, God, that you would put a tenacity within their spirits, that you would put a boldness, that you would put a bravery that they didn't know they had. God, that you would touch their mouths, that you would anoint their mouths in Jesus' name. And if you guys want, you can just pray over them with me. You can pray out loud over them with me. Jesus, that you would anoint their mouths, God, that they would be sent out like missionaries into the harvest field, God, that there would be something so captured in their hearts. And I pray, God, that you would remove any fear. God, that you would remove fear of man. God, that you would remove the lie that they can't start yet or that they're too inadequate. God, that you would uproot those things and that you would anoint them with a supernatural bravery, that you would send them on an assignment. God, that you would send students to them that would come confessing to them, not knowing where else to turn, and that you would give them a supernatural bravery, a supernatural grace, that the grace of God would be with you, to be able to speak, to be able to speak the words of Jesus, to be able to minister the Holy Spirit in power. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this hour. Holy Spirit, we yield to you. God, come and have your way. I thank you, Lord, for what you did in Asbury. I pray, God, that you'd continue to wake up high school campuses, college campuses, that you would anoint people to see the demons cast out, that you would anoint people to see the sick healed. Jesus, <laughs> thank you for what you're doing in this hour, Father. We glorify your name. Thank you, Lord. All right. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God. Let's just give a hand clap to the Lord.